Hello to those who will be watching the recording here shortly. Uh, before we begin today's candidate forum, I want to take a few moments to introduce myself and to thank both candidates for their time. Today we'll be hearing from Representative Sherilyn Stevenson of House District 88, uh, which encompasses parts of Fayette and Scott counties. But before we get to both candidates today, I wanted to first introduce myself. I am Benjamin Geese, Director of Early Childhood Policy and Practice for the Pritchard Committee for Academic Excellence. And at the Pritchard Committee, we strive to ensure a big, bold future for all Kentuckians. And while we know that the path to a larger life begins with a quality education for all, birth through post-secondary, we also understand the power of civic engagement. Strong civic engagement is a key ingredient in a healthy society. One of the ways civic engagement is measured is by voter turnout. And at Pritchard, we track voter turnout as one of 13 metrics in our Big Bold Future National Rankings Report to measure citizen engagement. You will hear Pritchard's Big Bold Future Report referenced throughout today's forum. The report is used to measure Kentucky's progress on educational and quality of life outcomes and ranks Kentucky's progress in relation to other states. The report is a helpful guide in determining where our Commonwealth is excelling and where Kentucky needs a bit more help in putting all citizens on that path to a larger life. By conducting several candidate forums in the build up to the general election in November, our hope is to see more Kentucky become engaged, informed citizens, and to exercise their right to vote. In the words of our president and CEO, Bridget Blom, engage communities with families and children at the center are vital to improving education outcomes in Kentucky. So before hopping into today's forum with candidates from House District 88, uh, we have just a few reminders. First, the Pritchard Committee, remember, is a nonpartisan and non-governmental organization. As such, we do not endorse candidates, but we do promote strong civic engagement and candidate education. Also, just a reminder that again, these are recorded and are made available to the general public via website, social media, and to members of the local press corps. Lastly, to ensure fairness, just a reminder that each candidate will receive identical questions and equal time to respond to each. But for now, let's welcome Rep. Sherilyn Stevenson, a candidate for House District 88. Welcome, Rep. Stevenson. How are you today? So much. I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for asking and thank you for taking the time to join us today. My we appreciate pleasure. it. My pleasure. Well, great. You know, we'd like to take a little bit of time at the beginning of each forum to get to know candidates first as people and then later as candidates for office. So as you think about that call that made you enter public service, how would you really define your why for becoming a representative in the Kentucky House of Representatives? And is there a particular leader that you seek to emulate in your everyday work at the state capitol? Um, <clears throat> well, I have always been someone who I've, I've always loved people and wanted to serve people in some capacity. My husband and I both um, take the motto of service above self very seriously. And we've both always been very civically engaged. Um, in 2017, 2018, um, when I was first deciding to run for office, we were seeing a lot of um, hubbub around pensions and teachers and, and some of the attacks on public education started. And that was really the driving force for me. My mother um, was a teacher. She was my second grade teacher. And um, a pension is a promise. And I know that our teachers here in Kentucky do not get social security. I know that when my father passes away, my mother will not collect survivor benefits from him. And that pension is all that she has. And I love her and I have several cousins and really good friends who are teachers. And so that was something that really drove me to look seriously at um, serving my community in this capacity. I think that public education um, is the tide that raises all of our boats and it's something that we have to fight for. We know that there are people out there who um, want to privatize public education. That is something that is coming at us and, and we're still dealing with that in the General Assembly today. And for the last four years, I have been one of the leading voices um, against charter schools, against vouchers, against any of those things that seek to 
pull funds from our already unfunded um, or underfunded public education. Um, well, I was just going to say Joni Jenkins is probably a person that I would say that I really want to emulate watching her lead become the first female floor leader to ever ever uh, in Kentucky and watching her lead with class and integrity has been amazing. And I, I hope that I can be half the legislator that she is. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful answer. And um, we certainly enjoy learning a bit more about your Wyver office, also your family background and uh, those mentors that you have throughout the state house. That's all certainly very interesting information. You know, as we think about uh, some of the challenges and opportunities at play in our state today, it's important to keep a good eye on our students. You know, we know that those students in all Kentucky classrooms every day, they're facing challenges, but on the flip side, they're also facing opportunities. And we know that what happens beyond the classroom has a big impact on those educational outcomes. We like to say here that kids don't grow up in silos, that poverty will affect health, health will affect education, education will affect safety, and so on and so forth. So here's our question. Mm -hmm. As you think about all the issues surrounding Kentucky students, what is your particular interest? And what's the area around students, families, and education that you want to be recognized as the leader in should you win another term at the State House? Uh, I think that answer for me is twofold. Um, I think one, in, in looking at students, um, we have done a pretty good job at bringing wraparound services to our, to our public schools. Um, and I think that we only need to continue with that. I think too many people too often forget that um, kids come in with lots of challenges and lots of barriers to learning, um, whether they are from, um, as you said, a, a low income background, whether they are um, an English learner. Um, some kids may be in foster care. Some kids may be in a home where mommy and daddy fought all night long. Some kids may be in a home where they didn't sleep in a bed. Some kids may come to school and they've had to get themselves up and get themselves fed. And they've had to do the same for their younger brothers and sisters. And expecting them to come in hungry and tired and sleepy or worried and start to learn and put their best foot forward um, is unrealistic. And so we have to find ways to help those kids and help them along because until they get to that, that level, they're not playing at a level field um, with their peers in class. And then another thing about that is that's only going to not continue to happen um, if we keep seeing attacks on teachers. We are not doing everything that we can here in the state to attract and retain um, the best and the brightest teachers for our students. And we absolutely should be doing that. And as a matter of fact, we've actually been doing the opposite. In the last few years, we have seen um, attacks on teachers um, from the legislature. Obviously, new teachers have been put um, into a, a new tier of, of pension system. They're put into a, a, a cash hybrid. So they do not get uh, a pension like their older peers do. Um, and studies show us that over the course of their pension, they're probably going to get about 20% less um, than their colleagues do. And, and, and that's that's not good. We are not going to retain teachers if they can go to surrounding states and, uh, and have a better retirement. But also, I think just supports for them. We see teachers leaving the classroom um, in record numbers. And so that means that the ones that are still there are overworked, um, already full to the brim. Classrooms are getting fuller. Um, and so I think that we really have to start looking at changing that dichotomy. What can we be doing to support these teachers? Because most of them right now will tell you they do not feel supported. They do not feel respected. Um, and, you know, the legislature is coming at them from every direction and trying to make their job harder. And as we have seen, everything that gets thrown at them, um, you know, from, from decreased funding into their classrooms to a global pandemic, they, they work so hard and they try to rise to meet every single challenge that we, that we throw at them. Um, but they've been, they've been trying to dodge a lot, a lot of, of, of daggers that have been coming their way. And we've got to find a way to stop that. Well, thank you so much for your response. 
you know, two years ago, the Pritchard Committee unveiled a six-year plan to add $1 billion annually to the state's education budget in strategic areas where the investment could be measured for impact. We called it the big, bold ask. And even with the impact of the pandemic, the General Assembly made some serious progress in that ask in the first two budget years of the plan, with key investments in items such as full-day kindergarten, broadband internet access, early literacy, and Kentucky's state university system. Those remaining components, those items on our to-do list of the Big Bold Ask include needed investments in childcare, in preschool, and in a fund for teaching excellence. Now, recently, the Pritchard Committee and a team of statewide partners released a Fragile Ecosystem 4, Will Kentucky Child Care Survive When the Dollars Run Out? A Fragile Ecosystem 4, a survey completed by over 500 of Kentucky's roughly 1,600 child care providers, and from 95 out of 120 Kentucky counties, found that once Federal American Rescue Plan, or ARPA, relief dollars run out, over 70% of child care providers said they'd be forced to raise tuition for working parents. Close to 40% said that they would have to cut their staff's wages. And over 20% said they'd be left no choice but to close their doors permanently. And currently, only about half of all Kentucky children arrive to kindergarten prepared, and our state ranks 41st in the nation of the number of three and four-year-olds enrolled in preschool. We were 28th in the nation back in 2008. So here's our question. With all these facts and figures in mind, how can Kentucky ensure more children access high quality early learning? Well, I am a huge proponent of universal pre-K. I, I think that um, it's not a magic bullet per se, but it really will check a lot of boxes that we need it to check. Um, obviously, being sure that, that children get in and then they can enter kindergarten um, on a much more equal foot um, as their peers is very, um, it, it's something that we, is worth our investment. It is worth our time and is worth our investment to do. And I think that we have to do it. Um, you know, we talk a lot about third grade reading levels and, it, and if, if kids aren't reading at a proficient level at that point, um, you know, their decline seems to go forward at that point. And then we also know that unfortunately, those third grade reading levels are, are what a lot of prisons use to forecast their population for the future. So I think universal pre-K and getting those kids in earlier, um, it's just like building a house. They have to have a strong foundation. And if they are not entering kindergarten with that strong foundation, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard for them to ever really get caught up. So. This is something that we must do, we have to do, but I think on the flip side, the support that that then gives to our families would be immeasurable. Um, we know that about half of families told us that someone in their household quit a job during the pandemic to care for their kids. And too many women have still not entered back into the workforce. And having a universal pre-K that their kids can go to, oh my gosh, that's like, 100,000 women that could enter back into the workforce. So that's huge. It's huge for families and it's also huge for our economy. Um, so I think that that is great. And then when people have kids and they know, okay, let's say mom or dad both are going to go work, um, then what they have to pay out in that early, early child care, um, you know, is going to be much smaller than it was if they were having to pay for for the three and four year olds. So it just would be such a boom to their household economy and it would be a boom to our, our state economy. But something that we also need to be worried about that I am very worried about right now is we're talking about we need to do this and we know that it's not, it's not a cheap endeavor to do. And uh, the supermajority in Frankfurt just um, reduced our income tax um, across the board and they have have measures in place to keep reducing that. But just that 1% means that we are going to have 1.2 fewer billion dollars, fewer, fewer dollars, $1.2 billion fewer in our state coffers. I get like, that is such an astronomical number. That's huge. And I just don't think that people then think about that. Um, we just had a budget that for the first time in I believe 16 years was a budget that did not make cuts. And 
we're going to turn around and take $1.2 billion away, then what does that mean? Once all those ARPA funds are gone, we're going to have to start making cuts again. Or, or we're going to add a bigger burden onto families because we're going to have to start charging more for other things. Sales tax will have to go up at some point. At some point, we will have to charge more. Uh, we'll have to start taxing groceries, taxing medicine. When we see states that don't have income tax, that's what they do, but they also have a huge base because of um, their tourism. And as much as we all love our horses and our bourbon, they can't compete with Dolly and Mickey Mouse and beaches and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so, you know, it's really worrisome because we have big problems that we see some clear solutions but that thing's, that's going to take money. And, and, and instead of trying to find ways to put more money in, into our state wallet, we have people trying to take money away. And um, they say that it's going to put more money in the hands of families. But on the back end of that, I think it's going to be more expensive for them in the long run. Well, thank you so much for your answer. You know, I want to pivot back to an issue that you raised earlier in today's forum. And that was around the issue of recruiting and retaining Kentucky's best and brightest for all of our classrooms across the state. You know, nationally, we've heard a lot about teacher shortages. And even before the pandemic, we saw a decline in the number of young people interested in, each, in entering our teacher preparation programs. And even those with those credentials opting for a career outside of the classroom. So I know that earlier you um, spoke to great effect on the need of retirement benefits, of pension, of uh, you know, making that a more lucrative career, let's say, uh, for those with excellent educational credentials and well-earned educational credentials. But aside from the financial incentive, what are some other tools that Kentucky could implement to ensure that teaching remains an attractive career option for our best and brightest both currently teaching and those who perhaps aspire to teach? Um, you know, I think, I think there are, are several things that we can do, but I, I also know at the end of the day, whether you're in corporate America or you're in public schools or wherever you are, uh, when, when employees get asked what they want, they want more time off and they want more money. <laughs> so <laughs> that's what it's going to come down to. But I think we need, um, you know, teacher supports, a very strong mentoring program. Um, but I, I think that changing the rhetoric um, around teachers and, and just supporting them, these are highly educated professionals and they do not get treated as such, unfortunately. Um, so their pay starts low and then they keep taking a hit to their pension, um, which I did in, in 2001 when those teachers were put into that cash hybrid um, you know, I have filed a bill to, to undo that, to put them back into a traditional pension. And um, I will keep filing that bill <laughs> every year that uh, voters send me back. I, I will keep doing that. But again, I think it's it's funding from the General Assembly would, would just be huge. And, and again, so it may not be an incentive to teachers, so it may not directly be their pay or their pension, but I think funding, just general funding of education would help. Um, their classrooms are overcrowded. So I think that seeing a, a smaller, much more manageable um, class size would help. I think being sure that, they're, uh, that they had all of the tools that they need to teach effectively, to be sure that they aren't having to pay out of their own pocket for those tools and for their, their classroom supplies. And I don't just mean things that make their classroom cute and inviting to the kids. I mean, we have teachers that are having to buy needed supplies. They're having to buy the markers so they can write on the whiteboards in their classroom. Um, so I think that funding from the General Assembly needs to go up. We know that um, it has been underfunded um, for, for a long time. You know, we had CARA and it came along and we shot up in rankings. Um, so, but a lot of the changes that were made during CARA time have all practically been undone. And so I think that we need to go back to looking at those, to seeing um, what, what things in the classroom, what, there are all of these external factors, um, but teachers go into teaching because they love kids. And so um, they know they're never gonna get rich with being a teacher, but they love children and they wanna go in and they want to, um, you know, just 
get in that classroom and teach. So what are the distractions that we're creating for them and how can we take those away? So how can we best support them? So that's probably um, teaching aids, paras, um, again, those wraparound services, being sure that there's a, a school nurse that they can send them to, um, being sure that there are uh, mental health professionals in the school that they can send them to when children are having, um, you know, a really hard time in class we know that that can be then a distraction for the other students. And it's really hard at this point anyway, for teachers to trying to be individualize their lessons and be sure that they're touching each child in the way that they need to. And when there's a huge distraction happening over here because some child has experienced trauma and they just don't know how to deal with it and it's manifesting itself in this really loud and distracting way in the classroom, they need help for that. And so again, while it might not be into their pocket directly, um, funding comes into play for that. We've had a ton of unfunded, unfunded mandates that the legislature has um, put on our schools. Um, we all want to make our, our classrooms safer. We want to um, we want to see those things happen, but we can't tell them they have to do it and then not give them any money. So then it, their classroom is getting more unfunded and more unfunded and more unfunded because we keep putting more onto them and asking them to do more with less. Well, thank you very much for that response. Um, you know, so far we've talked about the students in the classrooms, the teachers uh, that are serving those students and families. And next we have a question about curriculum. You know, as we think about a high school diploma, a high school diploma should be evidence that a student is ready to succeed after high school. But unfortunately, too many students today graduate diploma in hand without having mastered the knowledge and skills required to be successful in college, career, and life. The Pritchard Committee community profiles for all school districts show the state graduation rate in 2021 at 90%. But the state rate for meeting college readiness benchmarks in math, for example, is at 30%. And despite Kentucky ranking third in the nation in high school graduation, we rank 44th in the nation in higher education attainment and in meeting household income. So here's our question. How can Kentucky ensure both rigorous, meaningful coursework and provide the support that students need to transition to their post high school lives? Well, I hate to make everything about money, but a lot of it comes down to funding. Um, and it, that's where I think more teachers in our buildings create those smaller classroom sizes. And that that only helps. We know that that success rate is only going to go up um, when, when we have smaller class sizes. And when we have those smaller class sizes, that's going to allow for more individual attention per student. Um, and I think that that individual attention then um, can be crafted in a way that's really specific to how that child learns. We know that not every every child learns the same way. Some are visual, some need to read it for themselves, some need hands-on activities. And so when we have those smaller class sizes, that's going to allow those teachers to craft that. But I think it also would then allow um, for potting, if you will. So then, you know, you may have a class of, of all people that learn this way, and then you may be able to have a class of, of all people who learn this way. And then that teaching message gets crafted in a much more specific way um, that allows that child to learn. And I think that we're seeing a lot of student apathy um, to education and to school and to learning. And so I think that that then also would help um, their levels of, of excitement about learning, um, if it's a little bit more crafted to that student. I think that we, again, in, in taking apart how each kid learns and what excites them, what motivates them, um, but what hangs them up, I think that that's just that's a huge um, thing that we need that we need to do. Some kids um, may need very conceptual uh, learning styles. Again, that very hands-on. So I, I think the more money that we have coming into schools that allow us to individualize learning a lot more is, is something that we need to do. But also, I think 
having those other resources come in, being sure that there's a mental health uh, counselor there, as well as a guidance counselor. I think guidance counselors are wearing way too many hats right now. And I think when, um, when you have a counselor that's there that is really can solely be focused on um, uh, career guidance, and, and trying to help that child figure out what they want to do. And the, the earlier that we know what they're interested in and doing outside of high school, are they going to go into a trade? Do they want to go to college? And if they go to college, you know, what, what do they want to do? And then when, when that looks like a more practical application to that student, I think that then their interest in learning is going to go higher. And I think that you would then start to see their scores start to rise. Well, thank you for that answer. You know, uh, we've talked about teachers, students, the curriculum. At the Pritchard Committee, we think that a child's first, best, and most important teacher is their parent. So often we hear that parents feel left out of the education policymaking process. How can legislators work to engage parent voice earlier in the decision-making process? Well, I think that starts obviously going all the way back to universal pre-K, getting, um, getting those kids in early and allowing those parents um, time to uh, ha have another job. I think, um, I think when, we, when we see more parents be able to enter the workforce because those kids are in universal pre-K, obviously that's, that's more money coming into the household. So that means um, that People aren't working two and three jobs to keep a roof over their kid's head and food in their belly. And they're going to be able to then invest in that child's education a little bit more. Um, I would love to see us start doing parent-teacher conferences um, in, a, in a more varied way. I know um, sometimes, you know, if, if they're pretty standard, they're six to eight on a Tuesday night and you have um, people that are working and they can't get off work, um, you know, we have people, we know that we have tons of people in the workforce that they don't go to work, they don't get paid. And so when it comes to feeding your kid or going to their parent teacher conference, unfortunately, those people are going to choose going to work so they can feed their kid. Um, so I think finding varied ways to communicate with teachers and to be involved um, in their, in their, their child's education is great. Um, I'm a huge supporter of um, site-based decision-making councils. And I know that there's been some talk recently about possibly adding a, another position on for another parent voice there. Um, and I, I would take a very hard look at that. I think that that's something that we obviously wanna want to listen and, and value um, those students. And I know that we also have a lot of, a lot of schools um, a lot of schools in Scott County and Fayette County, um, you know, they're great. They have a, a really strong PTA and they're raising a lot of money. And so that then creates a lot of opportunity for parents to be in the classrooms and inside the schools and be a little bit more hands-on with what's happening there. And I think that some of our other schools um, maybe don't have as many opportunities as, as that. And we're uh, looking at schools that have, um, you know, a, a really high poverty rate. And so I, I think just being really creative about how we do that and how we um, engage them. But I also think we need to do a better job of being sure that people know how to um, access their legislators, that we are regular people and they can come see us or, or we'll come see them. I will gladly go grab coffee with anybody and talk about these things and be sure that they understand what's being talked about in Frankfurt and how that impacts then their family and, and their child, their student and what's going on in their, in their schools. I think that we have a lot of parents um, of late that do know what's going on and they are very loud and that's great but I think that they're a small part of the population um, that's being heard and it's kind of that squeaky wheel gets the grease kind of thing so I, I think that we do owe it to um, to our students to our teachers um, to our schools and our parents to try to get out there and 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 make communication easier. Well very good and we have just one last question and I Got to hold you to about 30 seconds okay. for your closing remarks. We want to be sure to give you the last word. Um, if there is a citizen in House District 88 showing up on Election Day and they show up to their polling place and their sole reason for voting that day 
is they want to see their representative in Frankfurt ensure greater educational outcomes for all children in Kentucky, birth through post-secondary, 30 seconds. Why should that individual vote for you? Again, public education is why I got into this in the, in the first place. Um, I've, said, I've said many, many times that public education is the hill that I will die on. I have been in Frankfurt fighting for um, these families for the last four years, and I would love to continue to do so. And I'm the only person in this race who will continue to fight against charter schools, vouchers, and things that seek to further unfund our public schools. Well, thank you so much uh, for those watching today. This has been incumbent representative Sherilyn Stevenson, a representative in House District 88, uh, which encompasses parts of Fayette and Scott counties. Uh, thank you so much representative for joining. Thanks, and sir. as representative Stevenson exits the Zoom, we have candidate Coleman in our waiting room. So thank you again. Hello, candidate Jim Coleman. How are you today, sir? Doing fine. Good afternoon to you. Yes, thank you so much for joining us here today. We appreciate it. Absolutely, Ben. I've been looking forward to this discussion. Well, we're certainly glad to hear that. I know we have just a few reminders, sort of housekeeping items, and then if it's okay with you, we'll hop directly into the questions today. Okay, sounds good. Okay, thank you. Well, just a reminder to those watching, uh, Pritchard Committee is a nonpartisan, non-governmental organization. As such, we do not endorse candidates, but we do strongly encourage and promote civic engagement and candidate education. Uh, just a note, again, today's forum is recorded. It will be shared on the Pritchard website, social media, and to members of the local press corps. Uh, we just heard a few moments ago from incumbent Representative Sherilyn Stevenson of House District 88, uh, which is part of Fayette and Scott counties. Uh, today, we're going to hear from her challenger in the election, uh, candidate Jim Coleman. Welcome, candidate Coleman. Thank you, Ben. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So, we really like to say that it's important to get to know all candidates running for office, whether they be newcomers or incumbents or folks who had been around for several election cycles. It's important to get to know these people as people first and candidates second. Um, I think that really helps to humanize us as we go throughout the political process and helps people to you know, find those commonalities that strengthen community rather than divide community sometimes. So as you think about your reasons for running to represent Kentucky House District 88 in the House of Representatives, what's your why for public service? What motivates you to get into this race? And in particular, is there a leader that you hope to exemplify should you come to represent the citizens of House District 88? Yes, you know, I grew up on a small little pig farm in Utigar Town that my great grandfather purchased on March 27, 1888. He and his family had tilled this farm as slaves, and the day he purchased that farm for $1,200, it transformed the lives of over 300 of his descendants. Over the next 135 years, it paid for me to go to Howard University. And I really want to bring that kind of opportunity to all Kentuckians, whether it's through launching your own business, buying a family farm or getting a good job at Toyota, or driving a bus for Lextran, and being able to be self-sufficient and to be able to take care of your family and to enjoy the American dream just like my family has over the last 135 years. There are just tremendous opportunities in our economy, both in Kentucky and Lexington and Scott County. And I wanna take the lead on being able to connect our community to those kinds of opportunities. Already led a major second chance job fair this past summer, where over 450 of our residents came to that job uh, fair. They had criminal backgrounds and uh, they were released and now they're trying to get back into the American dream. We had over 75 companies there that day from Lextran and Toyota offering jobs starting at 19 and $20 an hour. And it's transformative. If you can help someone to get back into society, to get a good job, to where they can become blue collar millionaires after working for 25 or 30 years. And while at the same time taking care of their families and ending that cycle of poverty and incarceration, that's what I'm committed to. I've been blessed all of my life with great ancestors, great parents, 
a beautiful wife, and I want to give back to Kentucky, the state that I love. Well, thank you so much for that incredible answer. I um, certainly love hearing that story and uh, quite an interesting historical bit there, too. Uh, that's one of my passions as well. So thank you for sharing that. Yes. You know, no doubt, um, all of the individuals that you have described in your answer to your first question, they encountered many challenges, but likely also encountered many opportunities along the way. And that's very similar for our students in Kentucky's classrooms today. You know, in particular, we know that what happens beyond the classroom has a huge impact on the educational outcomes. Here we like to say that kids do not grow up in silos, that poverty will affect health, health education, and so on and so forth. So as you think about all of the issues surrounding Kentucky students, what is your particular interest? And is there an area around students, families, and education that you want to be recognized as the leader in, in Frankfurt, should you be elected this November? Ben, all of my life, including when my father made me the manager of Colby Crest Farm at the early age of 12 years old, all the way throughout my entire corporate career, from Pepsi, Oscar Mayer Company, Altria, and American Express, to leading economic development in Westchester County, as well as in Prince George's County, I've always gone with less is more, and that if you can streamline your focus on the area that's going to have the greatest impact you can really make an impact and get great results. So for me, in this area of education, I think the most important area that I believe we all need to focus on and that I am going to be very focused on in Frankfurt is driving improved proficiency at the third grade level in the reading area, making sure that our third graders here in Kentucky can read and read at a great proficient level. Of course, the pandemic had a major impact on us, it drove down uh, proficiency a lot across the state. However, Kentucky now after the pandemic and we're spending $11 billion a year from federal, state and local tax dollars from our families who are contributing to this, we're at 39.5% on proficiency for the state. These are numbers again that were impacted by COVID. That means 61% of our residents can't read in the third grade. And that's critical because from the ages of being an infant all the way up to being a third grader, you're learning how to read. After the third grade, you're reading to learn. And it's a major contributing factor to illiteracy, which is one of the major reasons of why we've got a major crisis when it comes to workforce participation in our state, is that we've got a lot of illiteracy. Here in Fayette County, before the uh, pandemic, we were at 53.3% on proficiency. The pandemic came along. And now we're at 43.1, Scott County, 38.4 when you throw in the COVID numbers. But interestingly, you all did a great job on your website by identifying a little school called Perry View uh, Elementary School in Boyle County that with all of the problems that everybody dealt with, even with the pandemic, this beautiful little school came in at 59.3% on proficiency for reading, even during a pandemic beating the state, certainly beating all the schools in the 88th district. And so I really want to put a heavy focus on proficiency. But on that, I want to put a heavy focus on who's doing it right in our state. Who are those principals and teachers out there with all of the challenges that we're dealing with? You never can have enough money. If you ask any principal or any superintendent of any school system in the state, could you use another $100 million? Of course they would say yes, but we've got to identify best practices of where those educational leaders are making it happen. Again, my entire career from working on the farm, being a manager, and especially being a, an executive in major Fortune 500 companies, CEOs always understood that if we're missing numbers, usually it's about leadership. And we can make sure that we've got the right leaders who are sharing the latest best practices and holding people accountable, we're going to drive performance. And that always beats out giving out more resources and asking our taxpayers to cough up more than they're currently having to pay. I want to go to Frankfurt. First of all, I want to get over there to boil after I win. My first trip is going to be over to Perryville Elementary to talk to the principal and the teachers to find out what are they doing and can we share you all with the state can we make you the highlight 
my good friends, Ben and uh, the team over at Pritchard, they identified you. They've done a great job at identifying you, but I want to dig into what are you all doing with this cool, you know, day five reading and these cool programs that you're implementing. Are, are you spending a lot more money doing it? Did the state give you all another $50 million to launch this? Or is this an idea that you all came up with your own selves? Are you using phonics versus clues? What are you doing? Because I believe in let's replicate success at the lowest cost possible without asking our taxpayers who already are being very generous at $11 billion to improve the performance of our third graders so that we can then assure our adults when they graduate, whether if they, you know what, even if they don't graduate, if you can read at the third grade level, which means you're probably at some point in time, you're going to be able to read at the ninth grade level. Even with that, a high school diploma, I learned down there at the second gen's job fair, Toyota, Lextran, and other major companies in this area and in Kentucky will hire you yesterday with a fifty to sixty thousand dollar year job, where you can retire after twenty five or thirty years as a blue collar millionaire with about one point five to two million dollars in your four hundred one k. That's what I'm committed to, and that's what I'm going to make happen, and that's where I'm going to put my focus, Ben. Well, thank you so much for that incredible answer. And thank you also for highlighting some of our bright spots that we've identified throughout the state. Um, hopefully some folks from Perryville Elementary will watch this and be very happy uh, to they hear that. They deserve it. Ben, I really want to work with you and other thought leaders in our state organizations. And what, as a legislator, what we really need most is best practices. And what's working? And where can we pass good legislation to hold all of our schools accountable what can we do with our current curriculum? You know, the state of Mississippi, they're doing great work because they went back to using phonics and they're making sure that all of their teachers know how there are five key things that you need to, you know, components of teaching phonics. They're making sure that their teachers know that and they have already exceeded our reading proficiency here in Kentucky. They've always focused on how do we beat Kentucky because they've always been at the bottom. But by going to phonics, they're making it happen and their teachers are loving it. Kids are learning faster and paying better attention. And long term, it's going to make a big impact on their workforce throughout the state. Well, thank you so much. And we're thrilled to hear you um, reference some of the research in and around literacy, mm -hmm. um, which is a perfect segue into our next question, because a part of our work uh, in the Read to Succeed Act that thankfully passed last session uh, was tied to the Pritchard Committee and its big, bold ask. You know, over several years ago now, the Pritchard Committee unveiled a six-year plan to add $1 billion annually to the state's education budget in strategic areas where the investment could be measured for impact. That's what we called our big, bold ask. And even with the impact of the pandemic, the Gen General Assembly made serious progress on that ask with key investments in things like full-day kindergarten, broadband internet access, Kentucky's state university system, and as I mentioned earlier, early literacy. The remaining components of that ask items on our to-do list include needed investments in childcare, in preschool, and in a fund for teaching excellence. You know, recently the Pritchard Committee and a team of statewide partners released a fragile ecosystem for Will Kentucky child care survive when the dollars run out? A Fragile Ecosystem 4, a survey completed by over 500 of Kentucky's roughly 1,600 child care providers, and from 95 out of 120 Kentucky counties, found that once Federal American Rescue Plan, or ARPA, dollars run out, over 70% of child care providers said they'd be forced to raise tuition on working parents. 40% of providers said they'd have to cut their staff's wages, and over 20% said that they'd permanently close their child care center. And on top of that, only about half of all Kentucky children arrived to kindergarten prepared. Our state ranks 41st in the nation, and the number of three and four year olds enrolled in preschool. And we were 28th in the nation, a lot better, back in 2008. So here's our question. How can Kentucky ensure more children access high quality early learning? You know, I think we've got to look at every single option available. You know, we have a certain amount of funding that we get from our taxpayers each year, and we have to make tough decisions. 
Um, I'm going to get more involved in that, and I'll be more knowledgeable about that when I get down to Frankfurt. But just top line, there are a lot of areas that I think we can improve on our revenue generation. For instance, we're not enforcing child support. 46% of the amount of child support that should be going to our families is not being paid at an amount of $1.4 billion a year. So what happens when we don't get that child support from that parent that should be paying their part, that means the taxpayers of Kentucky have to come up with that $1.4 billion through Medicaid spending. We need to enforce the existing laws that we have on child support collection. We need to make sure that department works. I'm for transferring that department, for instance, to the attorney general's office so that we can make sure that we're gonna have accountability in that office to be able to get that done because it's crucial that before we ask our taxpayers to pay more, it's essential that Kentucky state government operates more efficiently and that we enforce and bring in the revenues that the state should be getting. So that's one area. The second key area in helping to make sure that our families have the money to be able to pay for child care is to make sure that our adults who are currently not working, which is 43% of eligible adults from the ages of 18 to 64, that they are working. If we simply went from the current level of workforce participation to the current US level, which is 61%, that means 180,000 of our residents would go to work. The good news is, is that we don't have a shortage of good high wage jobs in Kentucky. We currently have 220,000 open jobs that our employers are looking for employees to work. And none of these jobs are minimum wage jobs. These are good high wage jobs that could be transformative. And we, we get the workforce development funding from the federal government to pay for the training. So we've got to put more Kentuckians to work. When I looked at these numbers, you're looking at if everyone that would go into this 180,000 of the folks that we could hire in our state that are available to work to meet the U.S. standards, that would mean that would be equivalent to $9 billion more a year in the coffers for our families in Kentucky. That would result at 4% on our personal income tax for another $360 million. So before we start making a lot of commitments, long-term commitments, which the ARPA money helped us during a very difficult time, but that's a one-time use of money. Before we make commitments that are long-term on behalf of the taxpayers, we've got to make sure that we identify where's this money going to come from. Secondly, we've got to, I think, adjust our priorities. We've got to decide, are we going to be a welfare state? Or are we going to be an education state? I believe that long-term site selectors with big corporations who have great jobs that are willing to pay a lot of money with Blue Cross, Blue Shield, they're looking for an educated workforce. So the more we're committed to transforming Kentucky from being a welfare state where a lot of our residents are on welfare, unemployment, not engaged, flip that to more of it being an educational state then we'll be able to generate the revenues we need, whether if it's through public education or tax credits for families to be able to use that to choose whatever school they want to send their kids or if they want to do homeschooling. Whatever those options, we'll be able to have more income because we're going to be more prosperous and we'll be able to make those investments to drive overall performance, especially for third graders in our state, both in reading and math. That's critical. If, if someone like last year, you know, when you look at these COVID numbers, it's stunning. You know, when you look at African-Americans, African-Americans, you're looking at 20% proficiency in the state, which means 80% of African-American kids in the third grade last year can't read. No one's going to, and, and they probably got promoted to the fourth grade because we only have a certain amount of facilities and classrooms, so they probably got promoted. So those kids that came out of the pandemic, they're probably going to end up being illiterate adults, and they're going to be depending on the state, and they won't be sustainable. We've got to change that. We've got to really get focused on turnkey things that don't always cost a lot of money, 
to make a big impact like Perry, uh, Perry uh, View is doing over there. I, I like what they're doing. You know, I, Perryville, I, I just, again, I can't wait to find out, did we, did Boyle County come up with some extra money? Did the state, did the federal, did President Biden stop by and give them an extra 10 million? Probably not, <laughs> probably not. They're probably just, uh, the, based on you all's research, they're just doing some simple things. They're having reading days. They're allocating a big chunk of their time to reading. Uh, you've got a principal that is going around to the various classrooms to making sure that the teachers are teaching reading. Uh, they have it to be very collaborative and the students get to ask a lot of questions to, to not only have them reading, but confirming an understanding of words. You know, I, I just think we've got to replicate that kind of success because it's gonna be a while before we get everybody back to work at that, you know, the 43% of folks not working. It's gonna be a while before we reform the ability of being able to collect child support. So we've got to do some things that I've learned like in corporate America, what is the low hanging fruit that we need to go after that will move the needle on reading proficiency? If we could get, you know, for me, I'm not going to do this job forever, but I've been so blessed that I want to give back. If I, during my tenure in state government, if I'm blessed by the voters to be the next state rep, and if I could contribute to moving our needle from 39.5% to 85% of what Perryview was getting before the pandemic, I might be able to get into heaven to see my wife and my parents again when I leave to go to heaven, knock on the door of the good Lord and ask him to please give me a chance. He's going to say, Jim, well done. You contributed to transforming lives and you help the public school system to get to 85% without making the taxpayers broke. And you did it by encouraging others. You did it by setting standards, holding people accountable, listening to the voters, listening to moms and dads, offering options, and listening to great organizations like the Pritchard Group that gives a lot of advice and ideas on how to make things better. And that's what I want to do. Well, thank you for that. And, you know, as we talk about transforming Kentucky into an education state, you know, there are two questions that I'll sort of ask simultaneously. Um, one is that, you know, nationally hearing a lot about teacher shortages and then within our state hearing about the quality of educational curriculum, in particular, a high school diploma. So I'll start first with teacher shortages. You know, even before the pandemic, we saw a decline in the number of young people interested in entering teacher prep program throughout state colleges and universities. And even after the pandemic and even before it, we saw those with those credentials opting for a career outside of the classroom. You know, we know that research shows that a high quality teacher is the surest way to grow educational outcomes. Similarly, when it comes to curriculum, we think about a high school diploma in Kentucky. A high school diploma should be evidence that a student is ready to succeed after high school. Mm -hmm. uh, but today, unfortunately, we see far too many graduate diploma in hand without having mastered the knowledge and skills needed to be successful in career, college, and life. For example, the Pritchard Committee community profiles for all school districts show the state graduated in 2021 at 90%, but the rate for meeting college readiness, for example, only at 30%. And despite our state ranking third in the nation in high school graduation, our Commonwealth ranks 44th in the nation in higher education attainment and in meeting household income. So twofold, looping two questions into one question. One, how do we ensure that the best and brightest stay in the classroom or enter the classroom as Kentucky teachers? And how can students get both a rigorous and meaningful coursework evidenced by a high quality high school diploma? And how can we support those students to successfully transition to their life after high school? I think those are all great questions. Number one, uh, again, from my corporate background, each year they do uh, assessments, not only on the performance of their employees, but they also provide the employees a chance to be able to share feedback on the culture within down to the departments. And they want this feedback for two reasons. They want the feedback to ensure that they've got 
a motivated workforce and they want to understand what they can do to retain their current workforce, as well as to take that data to help them to better recruit. The federal government has an annual viewpoint survey of every single department throughout the federal government. And guess what? It's all online. Any of us can see it. We're all federal taxpayers. I think we need that. I think we need to be able to offer our teachers an annual survey that's online, that is confidential, but it provides data down to the school of what is the culture like? Do you trust your principal? Do you feel like you're getting support? Uh, do you feel like, are you teaching or are you spending the majority of your time with disciplinary issues? Uh, is your principal uh, engaged? Does your principal come around to the classroom and not just spy on you, but help you? <laughs> do they lead by example? So it's about number one, getting feedback before we make a decision on what we think might be the reason for why we're not able to uh, recruit and retain the best teachers. Number two, I think we need to make teaching fun again. We need to get out of their way. We need to streamline the focus again. You know, at Perryville, the teachers love it. It seems to be, again, from your research, it seems like the teachers there love working there. And the reason why is they get to teach. And we've got to do a good job in making sure that we partner with our parents to raise the standards that we're not going to tolerate a lot of misbehavior in our classrooms. And I think misbehavior and managing discipline, when you've got a young student who's worked hard, graduated from University of Kentucky, they're ready to go out and change the world. They want to do this three third grade thing that Jim Cole was talking about. They want to wipe out poverty. And they know that if they can teach a young child, even who's in poverty on how to read, that that young child will maybe be the next President Obama. And when they have to spend the majority of their time on disciplinary action, and then the students in there that are either meeting or exceeding performance don't get attention, and then they start to fall off, I think that is very disheartening for committed teachers. You know, is pay an issue? Probably so but I don't think it's the number one issue. All of us would love to make more money than we made last year, but teachers get into this for the challenge, for the impact, for the willingness to want to change the world through educating people so they will be sustainable adults. So I think that's what we've you know, got to focus on. As far as getting more of our students prepared to be able to go into the workforce or to go to college? I, I think that's a great question. You know, when I was in Prince George's County and I was leading up the Prince George's County Economic Development Program, we had this program called PTEC, where it was a partnership between the Marriott Corporation and we also did this partnership with Cisco Academy. So we created about 10 schools, for instance, on with Cisco Corporation to where we started in the ninth grade and each summer, kids would be able to participate in a summer internship or some kind of project with Cisco. Then that after they would finish up the 12 years, you know, get through with the 12th grade, they would go into the community college and get two more years an associate's degree that was based on Cisco, a Cisco program that was directly related to them being able to help Cisco to move things forward for their customers at Cisco. And when they would graduate from the community college, that same day they would get their high school diploma. Uh, Cisco already had a relationship with them. They got the best out of them because they were committed each year. And we had kids that were 20 and 21 years old stepping into jobs working for Cisco, making $75,000 and more and never looking back. I think we've got that opportunity with corporations like Toyota, uh, Lexmark, Alltech, and other big companies in Kentucky to be able to do the same thing, to partner with our public schools and to start early. I think the other opportunity is that not everybody's going to go to college. And we need to do a better job. You know, you asked a little bit earlier about, you know, who was one of your heroes outside of my mother and father, who I love dearly. My other hero was Booker T. Washington. And Booker T really believed that if you give, at the time he would say, man, of like course today we would say everyone, if you give someone a skill, they'll never have to want for anything. And this for black people was during one of the most still oppressive times in the United States. 
But because he made sure that black people were getting skills in the trades, everything from carpentry to welding to blacksmithing to uh, 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 all those area, electricity, all those key trades areas, they became successful. And many of them who went into the trades, their, their descendants later were able to do better in being able to go to college because they had earlier skills to be able to make a decent living during one of the most difficult times in the United States, but they became independent. Many were able to start their own businesses. I think we haven't even scratched the surface in the state of Kentucky of starting early for a lot of our kids and to getting them into the trades. I spoke with one of our big trades group here in Lexington, Kentucky, and they said their best student is someone who struggles reading, who struggles with math. And when we show them and take them through the training of working with electricity, working with plumbing, HVAC, the lights go off. Some people are good at learning and reading and, you know, going in a classroom and comprehending literature. And then some people are good with their hands and their minds on solving problems. And so I think focusing on the trades, partnering with our corporations to get kids earlier into a relationship and in certain industries that are growing, medical is exploding in the central area of Kentucky. We've got 8,000 jobs right now in the medical sector that pay $58,000 a year. We can't even find people to work for. We've got over 7,500 trades jobs that we can't even find people to work in. We've got over 3,800 IT jobs that pay $63,000. And this is not, a lot of these jobs, you don't even have to have a degree at UK. If you've got a certificate, you can get in on the ground floor and make 60,000. Now the median household income in Kentucky is 53,000. So these are jobs where you don't even have to get a degree in to be able to succeed and to be self-sufficient here in Kentucky. And that's, that's what I wanna be committed to. I mean, getting a college degree, I, I made a commitment to the University of Kentucky on, in honor of my wife who passed away April the 3rd, 2020. I made uh, a donation of $1.5 million towards helping minorities to go to the University of Kentucky in agriculture. Uh, but you're looking at somewhere between nine and 10% of the population that's gonna to go to college. We've got to focus on the 90% of making sure that all Kentuckians can achieve and participate in the American dream. I think they can do that with the things that I've just mentioned. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, a, a truly a wonderful answer. You know, we've spent some time today talking about teachers, curriculum, students, pathways, uh, parents, are, as you've mentioned many times, a very important part of this equation. Yes. At the Pritchard Committee, we believe that a child's first, best, and most important teacher is the child's parent. You know, we often hear that left out the legislative process. So I got to, we're running short on time, so I got yes, to you fast. answer here. Um, how can legislators work to engage parent voice earlier in their decision-making process? You know, along with what I was saying a little bit earlier about the viewpoint assessments, I think we need to, through online ways of being able to get teach uh, parents to be able to get feedback on the performance of the school as well. Um, at Prince George's County, they're already doing that. I think we need that across the state. Secondly, I think we need to leverage the power of multimedia and make learning again fun and to show parents the best practices and ways of how they can get their kids prepared for kindergarten, as well as how they can be good mentors and advocates for their children. My mother was the unbelievable advocate. She got me into, she knew I had problems at an early age on reading. So she got me into Head Start. I'm a believer in Head Start. And she worked with me and she even had to write a letter when Howard University rejected me. She wrote a letter to the president to say, give him a chance. He's gonna be successful one day. She was my mentor, like Ben Carson's mother, who was, he was, they were poor. She was illiterate. They wanted to put him in special ed. And all she simply did was each day, did you do your homework before you go to sleep, baby? Did you do your homework? And she didn't even know how to read. But these are simple things that we can educate our parents on. Our parents want their kids to be successful. The same parent that's up there in the bleachers fighting to get their kid on the basketball team and football team. Many of those kids struggle. And reading, they've got, the parents will have that same passion if we give them the skills and the knowledge of how to do the same thing for their children in reading and math as they do when they're rooting for them on some baseball or basketball or football team. 
So Very I want to drive that. I want to drive that and excite and motivate and empower parents to be successful, not just in sports, but in academics. Well, very good. And thank you for that. Our last question, and I got to hold you. I think you may yes. be a minute more so than 30 seconds. It's exciting, that's okay. man. It is. It's very exciting. I appreciate I love your the work you are doing. I've, I've loved this whole area. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, the enthusiasm is uh, is definitely palpable and we appreciate it. But our last question here, and we want to give you the last word. So if there is a citizen in House District 88 who's showing up on election in November and their sole reason for voting in the election is they want to elect the person who can best bring about higher educational outcomes for all children across Kentucky, birth through post-secondary. 30 seconds. Yes. Why should that individual vote for you? Jim Cole is going to cut the crap and close the gap. He's going to find <laughs> real ways of how to improve the livelihood of everybody here in Kentucky. He's done it by owning a family farm. He grew up on a family farm. He knows about how to solve problems. He's worked for four Fortune 500 companies. He solved problems with them and delivered results. And he's done it for two of the top counties in the United States. Cut the crap and close the gap. That's what he's going to do. <laughs> That's why Jim Coleman on November the 8th. Okay. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> and, I love that uh, book. It's called Cut the Crap and Close the Gap. It's it's on Amazon if you'd like to buy a copy of it, Ben. Well, wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I got to say, I'm a fan of the title. Um, so thank you so much for joining today. Again, I look forward to a good partnership with you all. I do. I look forward to being further educated. And I want to hear from you when I get down there. I can't wait to talk to you. And, partner with you on how to move the needle on education. Well, thank you for that. We sincerely appreciate it. Okay. Um, I want to say to those watching the recording, um, you've just heard from candidate Jim Coleman, a candidate for the Kentucky House of Representatives in House District 88, uh, parts of Fayette and Scott counties. Earlier today, you heard from incumbent representative Sherilyn Stevenson. Uh, we hope that this has been an informative hour and that you show up to the polling place on election day uh, with your decision in mind. So thank you so much to earlier Rep Stevenson and just now to candidate Coleman. Thank uh, you, we look forward to engaging with you both here shortly. Thank you and have a great day. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you, you too. We appreciate okay. it. Okay. Bye-bye. See ya.